Hello everyone, welcome back. We are so glad you are here with us again for the next installment of our journey through the book of Mark. Um, so we're in the third session, our third week. Uh, two weeks ago we talked about the beginning of Mark, how it like went super speed. It was like warp speed mm. through all the stuff that you know Matthew and Luke take like four or five chapters to get through. So basically you start with Jesus Christ, you got John the Baptist, you got the baptism, you got the temptation in the wilderness, and then Jesus' first message of, you know, repent for the kingdom of God is near. I think that's what he says. All in 15 verses. So that was our first session two weeks ago. Last week, we jumped up into the seventh chapter of the book of Mark, uh, where we met the Seraphonician woman. So Jesus had left town. He was in the, uh, the, in the um, area of Gentiles, if you will. Mm -hmm those uh, who were non-Israelites, uh, non-children of God, and has a conversation with a woman whose daughter was sick. And um, she asked for healing, and Jesus said, uh, you're not one of us, sorry. And she said, but, you know, even the dogs get the scraps from the master's table. In other words, last I checked, we're human beings too, right? We had a respectful little debate about the intentions behind what he said. So it was if you a didn't debate. see that, check it out. I won, so. <laughs> <laughs> That's not fair. You always win. Yeah, true. Um, but yes, because I agreed with you. Yes. Wonderful pastoral insight by mm -hmm. Pastor Kelsey. Just listen to her. Um, so that was last week. Uh, so we talked more about um, who is in and who's out. Mm -hmm. And through that conversation, uh, we find out that even the Gentiles are in. And how that relates to our lives yeah. these days. You know, we, we sit in those dividing lines, those walls that we build about who's in and who's out. But Jesus says, tear those walls down. We're all in this together. Hmm. So, uh, this week, we get another question. We're going to jump into Mark chapter 8. But before we do so, let us pray. Hmm. Oh, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we give you thanks for giving the gift of your Son. Send your Holy Spirit to guide us as we follow the way of the cross. And I love God's people say, Amen. Amen. So our reading for today is Mark chapter 8, starting in verse 27 and going to the first verse of chapter 9. Ah. So, Pastor Kelsey, would you please do us the honors? Always. I'll pick up at verse 34 and give you a break. Deal. All right. Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi, and on the way, he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they answered him, John the Baptist and others, Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. He asked them, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, you are the Messiah. And he sternly ordered them not to tell anyone about him. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days, rise again. He said all this quite openly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Verse 34, if you're following along. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life from, will lose it, and those who want to lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous generation or and sinful generation of them, the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. And he said to them, Truly I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death before they see, or until they see, that the kingdom of God has come with power. Hmm. It goes deep quickly, doesn't it? Yes. Hmm. And there's a lot that's happened from our reading, or since our reading from uh, last week as well. Um, so I, I definitely invite you to read those, some of the stories they are just still like, I don't know, every time I read how, um, so Jesus feeds the 5,000, feeds the 4,000, they hop in a boat after he had just basically, you know, fed 10,000 people plus women and children, uh, with, with a couple of loaves of bread, 
uh, the disciples didn't have any bread in the boat and Jesus is, and they're complaining like what we don't have anything to eat and he's like what really hmm. are you still not getting it I just fed 10,000 people you're okay <laughs> so here we have all this building up to this moment um, where there's this wonderful conversation between uh, this crowd and uh, the disciples Jesus gathers them together uh, and and starts to ask them who do you say that I am but before we get there, um, there's a couple of terms that I want to I want to tackle first. The first one is Messiah. Yeah. Uh, so the word Messiah is a Jewish word that literally means anointed one. The the Greek counterpart or the Greek uh, um, word for that would be Christos. Yeah. So Christ. And if you didn't know this yet. Jesus' last name is not Christ. <laughs> <laughs> That's why you see Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah, right? Right. So yeah. the word Christ or Messiah means anointed one. In the Old Testament, it comes up a number of times. Really, anyone who is a, uh, um, a prophet or a, a messenger from God, someone who has been divinely appointed. A deliverer. Okay, yes. Um, is known as a Messiah. So you come across this uh, in the book of uh, Samuel and, and Kings, I think, maybe even some Psalms. Uh, a lot of the is, uh, Israelite kings, uh, David, for instance, would have been known as a Messiah. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. Okay. Um, so a divinely appointed person from God. That's Messiah there for you. Um, so the idea of the Messiah then was someone who would come in power and yeah. save God's people. Yeah. Lead God's people. Uh, conquer those who fight against God's people. Okay? If all the Israeli kings from you know, ancient times, the, one, the great ones, you think of like David and Solomon and you know, like all these amazing kings that they looked up to, those were the kind of deliverers that they were expecting with the word Messiah. Similar, you think about you know, the word knight, samurai, those things, they evoke really um, vivid pictures of what that individual is and what they do. Right. That's Messiah. We don't think of it in that way because we've had the Christian tradition handed down, but this is, I love how you put that in context. It makes such a big difference. Right. Um, so along with that, um, in Mark, so at the beginning of the book of Mark, okay, in chapter one, verse one, it starts the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, of Jesus Christos, of Jesus Messiah. Mm. Okay, the son of God. So right from the get-go, Mark is telling us that Jesus is the Messiah. But up until this point in the story, even his closest disciples have no clue. Ah. So we know, because we already know the end of the story, and we're, you know, obviously after the we fact. Given but that information. Up until this point, <laughs> right, no one in the book of Mark is calling Jesus Christos or mm -hmm the anointed one, or a messiah. For all they, they know, he's a teacher, a rabbi, you know, someone with some kind of power that they can't understand, but not messiah yet, mm. okay? So that's important to note that as well. So we get this moment uh, where, where Jesus says, who do you say that I am? And Peter, okay, has this amazing moment. Gosh, I really wish I would, I would know the, the, the timbre, the emotion, mm. the way that it was said. <laughs> was it a question? Was you it a flat-out statement? Was it an exclamation point? Was it, you are the Messiah, right? In that moment where everything kind of built up, maybe? I don't know. Uh, I, I always hoped it was that, right? Uh, and then Jesus says, okay, don't tell anybody. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I, I believe he says don't tell anybody is because everyone has a preconceived notion of what Messiah means. Mm -hmm. They're looking for a political war hero riding in on a white monstrous horse with a sword and a shield who's going to whip up those Romans mm -hmm. and give them their land back and make them the most prosperous nation and the mightiest group of people on the face of the planet. That's their expectation of a Messiah. So here Peter says, you're the Messiah, and Jesus says, yeah, don't tell anybody that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Because right after that, he then begins to teach them that this idea of a Messiah must undergo suffering. Must be rejected by all of the elite Israelites, all the people, be killed, and after three days rise again. In other words, it was the exact opposite of what uh, the disciples wanted to hear. 
especially Peter. Yeah. Okay? So Peter has an expectation. Jesus says, well, you're right, but let me tell you about your expectation. <laughs> you're right, but you're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, which then, I think, uh, flows in nicely with how Peter responds. Yeah. Right? What are the words he says? Uh, he said all these things quite openly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, and Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. Right. Okay? So Peter was upset, because that's not what a Messiah is. A Messiah is one who's going to come in and conquer the people who have been oppressing them. And Jesus says, yeah, that's, that's not the kind of Messiah I'm going to be. Mm -hmm. So he wasn't too happy about that, right? So this is the first time Messiah is mentioned. It's the first time Jesus shares with his disciples quite openly, um, whether he did before at all or not. This is the first time Mark mentions that he tells his disciples what that means to be the Messiah. Hmm. Okay, And notice it's in Mark chapter 8. Last I checked, Mark has 16 chapters. It is literally <laughs> the exact middle of the book of Mark. Love it. I don't think that's an accident. No. I mean, that's a godsidence, right? That's... I mean, in fact, if you think about um, Hebrew tradition, uh, when you look at the Psalms, a lot of the Psalms are built that way where you can mark certain phrases, images, rhymes, uh, letters of the alphabet that will take the Hebrew Psalm and right at the center will be the nugget of truth if you trace things into this little Right. So here we have Mark, piece. and in the middle of Mark, Peter makes this confession. Mm. You are the Messiah. You're the one we've been waiting for. And Jesus defines it for him. Right. He Which isn't what he was expecting. That. Right? But, but thank goodness that God sent uh, the Jesus we needed rather than the one that we wanted. Yeah, it's interesting to think about it in that way because you have a declaration, right? A confession of faith. You have a definition of what it is. So open, authentic, honest and yet you see as the rest of Mark unfolds that it doesn't sink in. Right. Like just as it didn't sink in for Peter in the moment, it doesn't sink in for the disciples throughout everything they're about to encounter. They just, it's so contrary to what they expect and what they know that it just doesn't sink in. And that's right. why the, the quite openly is always, we can chuckle at that because like you're right there, you talked about it quite <laughs> openly and yet they're still shocked. And confused and dismayed. Yep. And it doesn't sink in until after the, the death and, and then resurrection, right? When they're hidden up in that he, locked up oh, room. Oh, he said he was going <laughs> to die and rise again. Oh, yeah. Oh, boy. <laughs> it gives me hope that the disciples must have been as hard hearing as I am. You know? <laughs> if Jesus can work with them, he can work with me. That's what I hold on to. Uh, so, like I said, we, could, we kind of climax in the book of Mark with this statement that Peter shares that Jesus is the Messiah, and all of a sudden everything changes for the book of Mark, yeah. right? So up until this point, the, expect, the hope was is that Jesus would be the war horse savior, the one who was going to rip out those Romans. And at this point, Jesus says, I'm a different one, and then the book of Mark kind of takes a little change, and now it's this Christ who will suffer. And, uh, and so that is an interesting kind of juxtaposition that's going on in the midst of this book as well. The, the whole book, in my mind, turns on a dime right in these verses. Yeah. Okay? Powerful. Um, so what Jesus was talking about with the rejection, of course, uh, I'm assuming he already knew that it involved a crucifixion. Now, a crucifixion was a means of capital punishment back then. It wasn't invented by the Romans, but they perfected it. Mm. Okay? Okay. Uh, so the Romans had basically created an execution that was so public and so inhumane that it would not only uh, be a punishment for the person's crime, but also make a statement to everyone else that this is what will happen to you or worse, which there was no worse, right? So this is what will happen to you if you also fall in line with this. So we were talking about uh, um, rebellious slaves uh, bandits, uh, persons to be judged for reasons of treason against the, the, the country or against, the, against Rome, okay? Um, if I remember correctly, Barabbas. Was it Barabbas? Yes, who, um, he led the uh, slave revolt. It was like 70 to 73, somewhere after, uh, um, I think it almost, if it, it caused the destruction of, 
of Rome, the, the slave rebellion, or uh, of Jerusalem. Um, but they took all, was it 6,600 of those slaves and crucified them on the road to Rome. 6,600 crucifixions to make a statement. If you cross Rome, this is what happens to you. That's crucifixion. Spartacus? Spartacus, thank you, not Barabbas. <laughs> Oh, thank you. Well, like, okay, it's similar, <laughs> but yeah. No, because I was thinking, you know, you've seen the old movie from the 50s with Kirk Douglas, who oh, plays boy. Spartacus. Yeah. But that image, oh, I'm glad you said that, because that image has always stuck with me, because we think of Christ on the cross, and it, and that becomes such an iconic image for us with the criminals on either side. But when you think right. about what you're saying and how people live in a context of crucifixion and that, that image of hundreds and thousands of people, just how disturbing and upsetting, especially under the rule of a, a tyrannical leader, anyone and everyone could be put up on a cross for very little justification. Whether they're guilty or not. Yeah, what a, it, it's living in terror, really, every day. Right, so Jesus wasn't the, cru the first to be crucified, obviously, so people knew what crucifixion meant, okay? Um, so all of a sudden, Peter and the disciples and anyone else who was hearing the story went from following a Messiah who was going to save them from Rome to now following a Messiah who is about to be crucified mm. with the worst execution known to humankind. So even that conversation, how much that must have changed... <laughs> I mean, it justifies Peter's response, or Peter's response of, of no, you can't let this happen. Yeah. Um, but everything would have changed for those disciples. Now, instead of following, uh, what does it mean for you to follow a war leader to now, what does it mean to follow uh, a loser or someone who will lose their life? Yeah. It completely changes their understanding of, of what it means to follow that kind of a God, that kind of a person. Uh, in all the history of all the religions, we're the only one who worships a God who was killed. Because mm. for everyone else, to be killed is a form of weakness. That if your God was, if your people were conquered, your God wasn't as strong as our God. And here we have Jesus Christ who died. So that thought of a God or the Son of Man who would be killed is following something very different than a God who conquers everything. So that part is going on in the book of Mark as well. And right after he drops this bomb on him about his death, he invites them to join him, right? <laughs> uh, in verse 34, he called to the crowd and his disciples, if any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves, take up their cross and follow me. So not only does he say, here's where my journey is going to take me, he says, and therefore, if you truly follow me, that's where your journey is going to take you. Right. Um, so that's discipleship, right? The invitation to be like Christ. And Christ says, uh, I, I have a cross. Um, now, to be clear, I want because this has always been distorted in my mind, uh, when people say they have a cross to bear, <laughs> or when Jesus says, pick up your cross and follow me, a lot of times we get this idea of we have to put up with something. Or God wants us to suffer. Right. right? Okay. Yes, it's very, it's problematic. Right. Picking up your cross does not mean you have a particular burden that you have to uh, put up with in life. Okay. Yeah. To pick up your cross literally means to carry Christ with you. To, to carry that notion of a Messiah who doesn't come to conquer and kill, but instead to love and to lay down one's life for someone else. Mm. Okay. So discipleship isn't about conquering other people. Jesus says, I'm going to invite you to join me on this journey where I'm going to think of others before I think of myself. I've never thought about it in that way before. <laughs> I love that. that. That notion of bearing the cross is carrying the entire meaning and life-changing reality of Christ's death and resurrection with me wherever I go. Yep. So you look at what Jesus says. Um, what does it mean for you to deny yourself? That's the first thing he says. You want to follow me? Wanna, you want to learn from me? You have to deny yourself. So ask that question to yourself right now. What does it mean to deny yourself? Okay, so start there. And then what does it mean to pick up your cross and follow him? 
What does it mean to not only deny yourself, but to also have others in mind as you move forward? Uh, to also have love be the very first thing, the very first factor involved in a decision, rather than hmm. what you want to get out of it or what's in it for me. I got a great story about this. Bam, let's hear it. <laughs> Last week, uh, our 10 year old was lecturing our five year old. This happens a little bit, Last week. like, and this happens every day. <laughs> but specifically, he was lecturing him and saying, Augie, you know, you have to put other people before yourself. And I looked at him and I'm like, high five, buddy, you're so right. And just a few short days later, the 10 year old was needling and making fun of the five-year-old and telling him, no, you can't have this because it's mine and yada, yada. And I go, you know, Owen, aren't we supposed to put others before ourselves? And he just, he kind of went like this and he had this huge smile and he's like, my words just got me, mom. <laughs> you got me, mom. It's <laughs> exactly right. It's hard. And it's easy to look at others and say, here's how you should be putting someone else's needs before your own. Yeah. But it's, it's personal. Yep. Deny yourself. And that's exactly what Peter didn't do, right? Mm. He was looking for a Messiah that would serve him and to serve what he wanted. He wanted the Romans gone. He wanted the power of the, God's people back again. And so Peter says, no, you can't let this happen. And Jesus' response to his number one, right? To his, <laughs> <laughs> to his uh, ne the next, you know, in the chain of command kind of thing is number one disciple. And he says, get behind me, Satan. I mean, I can't imagine... I mean, that wasn't like, you know, get your head straight or what are you talking about? He called him Satan. Dang, that's some amazing words. But I also don't think it was directed just to Peter, but also mm -hmm. to his, his frame of mind, to, yeah. his, uh, to, to his perception of what a Messiah was. He was calling out that statement for what it was. It was evil because it was so against what Jesus came for. If he came to, to carry his cross for others, then to think of yourself was about the worst thing for Jesus. Okay? Uh, <laughs> hence calling him Satan. Get behind me, Satan. You're putting your wants and your needs ahead of the needs that you don't even know about that we all have, mm. that all of God's people have. You know, Jesus, I think... Who knows? God finally realized that after all the conquering that happened in the Old Testament, there was no way to save his people by just conquering the next nation because there was always going to be another nation coming in. Yep. Right? Amen. So the, I think God finally, uh, as part of the plan, maybe he had it all, all laid out, but it, it occurred to him that the only way you can conquer the real enemies here, right, of sin and death, is to go into death and take its power from it. Mm. So here you have a Messiah that is a very different kind of Messiah. One that is for people and not for self. I like too that this, you know, I like that you mentioned a little bit of the context of the book that you're hopefully reading a little bit every day to follow along with the entire book, but because this is a really kind of rigorous mind moment, uh, theological, intellectual, they're getting their words out and making sense of meaning. But in the midst of all of this, in the midst of Jesus, you know, telling people the, you know, the very harsh and challenging invitation of deny yourselves, Jesus is also very busy making sure people are taken care of. Mm -hmm. And so denying yourself doesn't mean um, I'm worthless, I'm nothing, I'm no good. Right. You, you're denying yourself because you, Jesus is providing for you in the midst of that, right? People are being fed by the thousands. People are being healed. People outside of the insider club are being invited in. Jesus is busy doing that work too. So denying ourselves doesn't have to be sort of this self Abasement. harm. Yep. Um, but it is actually because we're taken care of, we are, it sounded like you now. <laughs> because we're taken care of, we get to shed the burden. Ooh. Oh gosh. Amen. Ooh, speed fingers. <laughs> Stop it. Preach it. Preach yeah, it. Preach we, it. We have that the privilege to, in that confidence that we're cared for, be able to put the needs of others Amen. before our own. Amen. Um, so a couple questions to, to chew on. Okay, We already mentioned a couple of them. What does it mean to deny yourself? What does it mean to pick up your cross and follow Jesus? Um, it's a couple of the questions. Uh, what are some of those things 
that you are following that are on, um, you know, human, uh, the, the, the human earthly things, things. The earthly things, yes. right. Okay. Ooh. So what are, what are some of the earthly things oh, gosh. that, uh, that you have your mind on? Okay. A lot of times those are, what do you, what, what do you want? Like what, what are the things that you're after? Not necessarily need, just desire, uh, maybe lust after what are those things? Okay. And the second question of what are the divine things that you have set your mind on? Okay. Uh, and that, if we're honest with ourselves, might be a hard one to answer because we're not going to like the answer. Mm. I know there's a few things that I'm, you know, that I think about or focus on that definitely convict me on that as well. Um, so I think there's an invitation there to do some soul searching and to see what does it mean to follow Jesus? Because he's saying, hey, deny yourself and put your mind on heavenly things, not on earthly things. So what does that look like? Mm. Who does that look like? Mm. Um, and finally, I think at the, at the end of this is that same question that Jesus answers or asks Peter after the, all the disciples give him all these different answers of, well, some think you're a great prophet. Some think you're a great teacher. Some think you're the, the coming back of one of the ancient greats. Uh, Jesus says, well, who do you say I am? And that's the question that I want to leave with you. If you have to talk to a friend uh, later today or tomorrow, and they don't get it. They, they want to know more about it. And they ask you the question, well, who is this Jesus? Okay. I think there's an invitation for each and every one of us to have an answer. How would we answer that? Who is Jesus to you? Who is Jesus to me? Mm. Because I think if we're able to answer that in our own way, there is no textbook, like clear cut answer. And gosh, don't just say, well, he's the Messiah. No. Uh, <laughs> what does he mean to you? Right. Who do you say that I am? is what Jesus invites each and every one of us to answer in our lives. He doesn't ask us either, who do you think that I am? No. I never thought of this before either. Because the more important question is, who do you say that I am? Yes. Not what's up here necessarily, but what is coming forth out of you and into the world. Yep. Or how do you show? <laughs> how do you show, do you that, show I that I am? Right? Oh, yes. Same kind of idea. Yep. Um, so a lot to chew on. There's, there's a lot here. It's not just a story on some paper here. This is a story meant for us. Uh, as we are, are picking up our crosses and following Jesus, we, these questions are for us to wrestle with as well. So I pray that uh, it is, uh, I want to say a joyous experience, but it might not be. I pray that it's a meaningful one for you to, to journey through these questions, hmm. uh, to wrestle with them, and maybe even uh, allow it to be life-changing. You know, what does it mean to follow Jesus and, and not just do what we want? Sometimes those things align together, which, which is a lot of fun. Sometimes they're very different. Uh, but nonetheless, there it is for you. Uh, next week, we continue with Mark chapter 9. So we're actually picking up right where we left off. We left off on 9 verse 1. We're doing verses 2 through 13 next week. Uh, and then, of course, please continue to follow along with the daily verses that Pastor Kelsey is sending out. Uh, as we read through the entire book of Mark uh, over these six sessions. Mm. Okay. Awesome. Okay. Have a wonderful Have day. Have a great week. Take care. Bye.